Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, Jonathan Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Coming at you on 9.17 p.m. Sunday, April 14th, which will forever be known as the day that my daughter made her first Holy Communion. <laughs> And we celebrate her and we went out of our way to celebrate her today together, John Macri, yes. and to your lovely family. Congratulations, uh, specifically to Scarlett Ray. Um, and that's the only significant thing that happened today. Oh, no, no, wait. One only other thing. thing. I forgot. Hold on. We're, we're burying the lead here. Uh, my sister-in-law also had a white <laughs> coat ceremony in at the St. John's University Uh so that's what we did today. What, what do you think Knicks fans did today instead? Oh, man. Uh, what a day this has been, man. I haven't seen you in uh, like five and a half hours. Or About five hours. Hours. Yeah. Well, About okay. <laughs> Maybe six, but one of those hours was spent in traffic getting out of Brooklyn. Thank you, New York, for closing the BQE eastbound. Totally made my zigzag through the corn maze that is Brooklyn so much more convenient to try and get to St. John's in time. But but it was well worth it um, because uh, whilst whilst you were with me and and my family and and well, assorted loved ones uh, celebrating my daughter's uh, first Holy Communion party, uh, we were also keeping our eye on a certain basketball game. A little bit and a little bit. Uh, it's funny. you I, you didn't you didn't have anything to drink drink today, right? No, I drive the drive later, which because that would have stopped me from drinking, right? No, I didn't drink anything today. No, okay. Well, I drank enough uh, for the both of us, I think. Um, no, so we we were at the bar. You were at the bar, like steadfastly throughout. Really, I think the entire first half of the game, and then once the food started coming out, you sat down, but you had your your phone propped up. So I don't I don't really think you missed any of the action. I, as I was trying my best to entertain. Um, guests and whatnot had to like veer off here and there, but I feel like I got, I was pretty, pretty keyed in for the most part, but not fully until we got to the fourth quarter. And that's when I threw by the grace of God again, happy communion, Scarlet, right? By the grace of God, I was able to lock in and, um, and watch, um, Watch something that was really significant. I, I, I let's let's start there because like we're, we'll you know we'll we'll bounce around. This is kind of like the appetizer to what we are going to do here at Nick's Film School this week. We're gonna we're gonna we have a lot of stuff to preview, uh, which will be difficult for the next few days because we don't know who this team is playing yet uh, in its first playoff game. But we'll we'll make our way. But it's going to be a week full of preview content. But th this is really just kind of the 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 entryway. The, the the we're in we're walking through the foyer. And we're kind of coming off the regular season, a little bit of a recap, a little bit of a what lies ahead. So I, I kind of just want to start with like, what does today mean to you after this season, after the last four years of Leon Rose era slash Tom Thibodeau era, um, after the last, you know, 24 years, really, um, since the since the 2000 season which is which is you know they made a conference finals last time they made a conference finals or even if you want to go back to I mean, we go back further than that we go back to the 90 to the 94 season which is other than t the 12 13 year uh it was the the last time they've had a two seed i mean what that's a lot that's a lot of history that the Knicks are 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 kind of have confronted um, as they have made this run, especially this late run up to standings over the last few weeks. Um, so what it means to me is where we're starting here. What this yeah. this significant win, this overtime win to wrap up the season, what it means to me. And I think it's it's like very clear that and I'm not. I'm not promise. I'm not calling you out because I know that this is a, like a unanimous thing that there are a lot of people, and myself included, that if they could have chosen not to play the winner of Philly versus Miami, they would have been okay with that. 
And I'm sorry if this head coach that I'm just tired of you doubting John Macri and and I'm just going to go and defend him as often as I possibly can hasn't instilled a culture and an identity in me that you respect the opponent by competing against the opponent. And as I'm watching the Bucks and Dame Lillard go two for 14 in Orlando as they continue to slide to end their season, as I'm watching the Cavs sit Darius Garland and fall to the four seed. Let's also remind everybody, um, the Orlando Magic were the three seed a week and a half ago and had to finally, with their magic number at one for like four days, win a game to get up to five. You know, like we could talk about what Philly is and and how intimidating they are with Embiid. And if that's the series, we're going to cover it great and we'll respect the opponent. I think it'll be a great series. But they've got some pretty bad losses to Brooklyn and Memphis in the last two months without Embiid that you probably should have won without Embiid. That is why they're the seven seed right now. And I, I echo the folks over at the rights to Ricky Sanchez that are saying it stinks that we won our last eight games and didn't get out of the plan. The Knicks earned this. They're the team that rose to the top. They're the team that ran through the finish line. And I'm so proud of this basketball team who has played shorthanded since Jaime Hawkins Jr. took a charge in late January. And all they've done is overachieve. All they've done is prove everybody wrong. Every single time we're thinking they're out of gas. This is when we're, we're headed the other direction. And they ran through the tape. So 50 wins is significant. A two-seat is significant. And the way we end this regular season for me is with arguably the most proud I've ever been of a Knicks basketball team. Um, trying to think if what the competition is for that title. I mean... 99. And so basically a, a final run, a finals run is an eighth seed. But there's so many other complications, you know, of that... It was a shortened season and everything, you know. Well, but as we've kind of, we've we've touched on that season a few times on this pod before, that season was unbearable. <laughs> the year, the, the the regular season, those fifty games was truly like, I I mean I I I remember it, but I also remember not being fully invested because every time I I turned around, they were scoring sixty seven points, uh, for for an entire basketball game. And like, oh, okay. I mean, that was lo- the league at large. Then it was the lowest scoring season, I think, in the history of the league since like the shot clock had been instituted. Um, but they were just a mess. And like Van Gundy, Jeff Van Gundy has talked about how they were a mess. And then it was like they got down to it was literally the last week, and they were like, all right, let's let's put it together. And yes, what they did in the postseason made you, yeah, it made. I mean, that's the stuff that that dreams are made of this is obviously different uh, a very different tenor in that I think and my goodness what a season it's been I mean you look at who was on this team to start the year and for, for and who's on the team you know to, to finish it's 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 really incredible like I, I don't know how many teams here's one <laughs> first time I've thought of this how many teams in NBA history have won 50 games where four of the five players in the starting lineup to end the season were not in the starting lineup to begin the season. Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Hart, OG Ananobi, and Isaiah Hartenstein. And I understand that there we could look at each of those things individually and be like, well, yeah, I mean, of course, Dante was in this is in the starting lineup. Like Grimes kind of struggled and they needed a little bit more off the bench. Okay. Of course, OG's in the starting lineup. They traded to, you know, the two, I mean, you say highest pedigree young players, highest, you know, value young players, whatever you want to say um, for, for him. Uh, of course, Josh Hart's in the starting lineup. Julius Randle went down with an injury and, and, and Hardenstein, you know, with the Mitch injury and everything, but like, Four out of five. And the team, and it's not only that, it's not only that, it's four out of five. And their preseason over under, I looked it up the other day, it was either 44 and a half or 45 and a half, which it was a 44 and a half. And you could tell me, and I don't know, I'm sure there are probably a few teams that have 
turned over their roster to a significant degree over the course of NBA history and exceeded their preseason over under. But I would wager a goodly sum of money that any other teams that have done it have traded for a superstar or star, superstar, whatever, high, high level player. OJ Ananobi, obviously hand in glove fit, but he's a, he's the best role player in the NBA that he's not a star. He's not a bucket getter. He's not what do you think of when you think of that, that sort of player. So to have taken that journey, um, when it would have been allowable at various points in time over the last several months to just pull over by the side of the road and just kind of sit idly as everybody passed you by and you'd have a pass to do that. It speaks to all the things that you just very eloquently went through. Whereas you have these other teams that in theory have a lot of pressure on them, right? Milwaukee, I don't know who, who has more? Pre- who had more pressure on them this season than the Bucks? Maybe the Suns, Clippers. Then, then the Bucks. Nobody in my mind. Like those three, right? Those are the three teams, right? There is pressure on the Cavs with whatever you think might happen well, with Mitchell, but like well, that's, to, that's the yeah. conversation. Those four teams in the East. It's it was, well in the East include Boston, and to their credit, they have lived up to the to the to the pressure. But then it's the Cavs and the Bucks, and for both of those teams to do what they did down the stretch when it was right there for them. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking it was, what was it, two weeks ago where you put up, <laughs> I, w- I thought I was being funny when we were doing the standings update and you put, you kept Milwaukee in the standings update and I'm like, sorry, Andrew, I'm not going to waste the listeners fucking time by reading mm-hmm. their remaining schedule. And I was, I was, I, I was just, I was trying to be conscientious of our time. <laughs> Look, the, you know? that was a week and a half ago, which is the craziest thing. That was after yeah. the Thunder game that we were like, all right, we can move on from this this two seed nonsense. What we didn't realize is that the Bucks were then going to lose three games to lottery teams and then to our team. And then, you know, Giannis injury aside, because who knows what the Bucks? I mean, they may be one and done in the playoffs, depending on what Giannis' status is. I know Chris Haynes in his last report is that Giannis will be available. That is a big body on a calf strain. I am very curious to see how he looks against an Indiana team that's going to make them run a track meet. It, in my opinion, the Knicks trending one direction, playing 40 plus minutes consistently, doing anything that is asked of them, regardless of how much they shouldn't be contending with teams like this, to then watch the exact inverse of a team that went all in yeah. on a couple Hall of Famers like the Bucks. Just go to the complete opposite direction. And look, I, I've given you shit or really given Doc Rivers shit. No, for, man. Like what he's been as a head coach. Hall of Famer. Like has has won a ton of basketball games. He'll get in. He'll get in. I, I hate to. Oh, he's not a Hall of Famer yet. He was on the not, best no, no, coaches list. That's what it was. When he did the best 75 years list. Did he, he make it? On, he made the top 14. And I was Are like, you sure? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to look like, it up right now. Keep talking. Steve Kerr made it. And I was like, Doc's there too, right? Regardless, the point being, I, I think you saw the difference in philosophies as he's blaming the travel team and the the he water boy and every single person but Doc and finding scapegoats. And our head coach is like, we're playing to win every game. Like, it's the whole point of playing basketball is to win. Like the quotes in Fred Katz's article today. Yeah, it's Great so article. significant that it's not just Tib saying this. It's Dante who played 53 minutes today. <laughs> like the whole team has bought in. And I really hope this fan base has bought in too. Cause regardless what happens of this first round, this was, this was a special thing that we witnessed. I don't, I don't have a frustrating loss. That's like, Oh my gosh, you should have won this game since the, since the trade, at least like it's, it's Utah from December. So we're blaming altitude. Then there's the Houston game. That I'm more upset with the yeah, bad call stolen. at the end of the yeah. game. Then there's the Hawks game that they got blown out. That's no the, Brunson. The, the, no Brunson and Josh Hart. I think was like significantly other people were out in that game. Josh Hart. That was and the that game. was a that was a close game with eight minutes left. It was tied in the fourth quarter exactly. And then the other under 500 loss that they have this year is who? Oh, it's Spurs. when Victor Wimbanyama <laughs> went for 40 and 20. Yeah. Like those are the bad losses. This team took care of business this year, and I don't know the blowout game that I'm like, oh my gosh, you got completely outplayed tonight. 
So I'm looking at one team that has earned a two seed. They may have to earn the second round even more so. But I, after watching what they did to earn that two seed, I can't not be proud of them and confident in them that they're going to do whatever it takes to make said second round. A couple of things here. Um, there have been... What's the right word? There have been teams in recent memory in the East in particular that have gotten top two seeds. Again, your memory is better with this stuff than than mine. Uh, the Raptors... Raptors got the one seed one year, right? In the De- in the DeRozan, yeah, last in the, one. DeRozan the last Lowry one of the DeRozan yeah. when when doing Casey. That's when LeBron was a four, and then we know what happened. Yeah, and it was like they finished with the one seed, and positively nobody cared uh, because everybody was like, "Well, we we know we know what's going to happen in the playoffs because one team has LeBron James and the other doesn't," and then and sure enough, that transpired. You could make a similar argument about this 50 win um, accomplishment and this second seed being hollow in that it is second behind a team that, again, by net rating, um, if not by win total, 64 wins, very good. It's not all time good, but it's very good. Uh, by net rating, though, is one of the is profiles one of the greatest teams of all time. You could, you know, and I think the national conversation over the last week to two weeks surrounding the Eastern Conference, putting aside the Embiid Philly piece of it, which that is definitely a developing conversation, and I cannot wait to see what the talking points will will be. Uh, although I imagine we will, they will, we'll probably wait until after the Philly Miami game for for that to really coalesce. Um, but the but the talking points for the last few weeks have really been around like look, this is Boston's conference. If they don't come out of this conference, it would I mean it would be a a a disaster of like monumental proportions. And like, I I mean I don't agree with that, or excuse me, I don't disagree with that take. I think that's a fair take because if Boston does not come out of this conference. It is kind of a disaster of monumental proportions for the right. Like that's all, all those other teams that other than the Spurs that are in that top ten net ratings ever. Yes. They all are like teams that made the finals or won. You know? We've gone through we've gone through it. The Spurs lost to the seventy three win Warriors. The seventy three win Warriors lost on J- Draymond Green kicking LeBron James in the testicles. The well, real quick, the Spurs lost to the Thunder that year. So that's why it would be even more so of an upset if the, I think if the Celtics were to lose, because there's no, I love the Knicks, obviously, and I respect Joel Embiid. There's no Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, Thunder, that was also a 57 win team that's in the Eastern, that's in this conference that the Celtics could be like, oh, we lost to a team that's just as good on paper. You know? I was talking about the 15, 16 Spurs, which they, right. they, they were an elite, um, Offensive, whatever. There's the if you look at the top ten net ratings ever, the vast majority of those teams either won the championship or at the very least, lo- or, or either won the championship or lost to a team that won the championship. Mm-hmm. Um, Did I say Warriors so what, or Thunder? By the way, you said you said Thunder. Okay, just making sure because that's what I'm talking about. That 2016 Spurs team got eliminated in the second round to the Thunder. I'm talking about the Kawhi Zaza. Spurs. Oh, that's the next year. That's that's the year that won. That's, that's the, next the year, year that they the year look before. it up. We, we have we're gonna have to go. Do we're we're a going live, folks. Right I'm pretty sure 2015-16 is the Spurs right team here. that 20, had that. 2015-16, which is the year the which is the year the Warriors uh, won 173 games, 173 games, and then lost in the finals. Net ratings for that year: San Antonio Spurs positive 11.1, Warriors positive 10.6. That was the big San Antonio net rating year. I think what you're talking about is the 2011-12 Spurs that won that went 50 and 16. But they only were positive 7.7. They lost to the Thunder team that eventually went on to lose to the Miami Heat in the finals. The 2016 Spurs that had that net rating better than the 11, than the 73 win Warriors, lost yeah. in the second round to the Thunder. 
because then the Thunder went up 3-1 on the Warriors in the conference finals, and we get Clay game six. What and was then Kevin the Kawhi Durant, Zaza year then? That's the following year when Kevin, because Kevin Durant was on the Warriors that year. And for some reason, the that's, Zaza okay. incident prevented us seeing yep. if You're that right. first team yeah, You're right. was able to defeat the 67 win Warriors at the time. So, so this is why you're the best. This is this is my wheelhouse. Just fun trivia like that. Point is, which again, we've gotten that out of the way. The point I'm trying to make though is there's no Warriors or not. <laughs> no, now no. I'm doing it. There's no Thunder. There's no Kevin Durant yeah. Thunder out there. No, that's I know. Like they won 57 games that year and just had the Spurs number and almost beat the Warriors too. So again, the the long story short, I. Like the the national narrative coalescing around this is Boston's year, and if it's not Boston's year, then something's gone horribly wrong for Boston. Like that's very fair. Um, and at the same time, I think this rings differently. What the Knicks have accomplished, I think this rings differently from what like the Raptors did that year, and what some other teams maybe, especially in the, again, focusing on the East because there's been no easy seasons in the West for, I, I don't know, very, 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 very long time. Um, because of what we just talked about, because of all the changes from the beginning of the year to now, and most of all, most obviously, because of the injuries that they have overcome and implicit in all of that are, are a couple of things that are hovering over all of this, which is, and they're intertwined, the Knicks, unlike the Cavs, when they traded for Donovan Mitchell, the Bucks, when they traded for Damian Lillard, um, and yeah, I mean, really, those are the two teams that we're we're talking about here. Unless you want to throw, I mean, could throw in the Heat. I mean, the Heat did throw, give up a future unprotected first round pick for Terry Rozier. I know it's he, Terry Rozier's not Dame. He's not. He's not Donovan Mitchell. But like they, they kind of made a not all in move this season. But they definitely put their cards on the table. You know, to say nothing of like the Hawks, who we don't even think about because it's been such a disaster. But they gave up multiple future unprotected first round picks for Dejounte Murray. Like as opposed to all those teams, the Knicks have yet to make their all in move, and. Partially because they have not done that. They had an out this year when Julius went down and when OG was hurt, where they could have very, very, very easily kind of packed it up and shut down OG for the year. Certainly, I think, Um, especially once it was kind of revealed that, like, you know, Julius Randall was not going to be back and like everything going on with Mitch. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know how other organizations would approach this, but we don't need to worry about that because we know how this organization is going to approach something like this. And we've gone now 23 minutes talking, and I don't think we've said Jalen Brunson's name yet. And like, I, I appreciate that you're giving credit to Tibbs because I do think what the head coach the, the tone that he sets and all of that. It's like, if you're, if you're not going to, if you're not going to bring the mentality of the locker room, which is like, we're, we're here to win and we don't really care about anything else other than winning. You're not going to play. If your best player is not going to buy into that. And we, I, I know this, we're not breaking any new ground here, but like you saw that today, you saw that today when this game, like this game, like this is an eight point game in the fourth quarter. Like the Knicks, we haven't talked about the game yet. I mean, DJ Zulo did a great job of that, but like, I don't like the Bulls were making shots. Knicks defense was a little like, eh, wasn't as, as maybe as good as it could have been. A lot of turnovers. Yeah. Well, tw- uh, second most turnovers of the season. I believe their season high in turnovers. I looked it up before was 22. Uh, yeah. 22 turnovers. They had 21 turnovers today. So lot, turn the ball over. And the Bulls just made a lot of tough shots. I mean, Kobe White, DeMar DeRozan, Vooch. My God, Vooch. Caruso, um, my gosh. And he was playing like Scottie Pippen plus Kawhi out there for most of that fourth quarter and overtime. Like this Bulls team is a... They're, I, we've been saying it the last few weeks. They're a nasty little team. Um, So like it wasn't... It wasn't going to go down as like some, you know, reprehensible, indefensible loss like that would raise you know, massive alarm bells. Um, It does go to, it does go to show like this, this next team, like they're, 
they they may be in they may not have as much firepower as other teams that are capable of just walking onto the floor and if everything is going like it's not even going to be a game they're just going to blow you out i know they've done that with this version of the lineup when did they do that recently they did it one one time where they just like blew the doors off somebody since og has come back this most recent oh uh, it's it's boston is the game you're thinking of Yes, which is like, again, it's like, well, Boston, when did they let go of the rope? How seriously did they take it from, you know, the opening tip? So, yeah, it was the Boston game. Um, I was just answering a question. They blew out Boston in three quarters. Yes, they blew up. Exactly. They blew up Boston in three quarters. I, I still think on average, their their uh, their likelihood of like just like blowing the doors off teams might be a little bit lower than a team like Philly um, who if Embiid has it going and they're hitting shots like they just they really become a bear um, but no I mean to 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 the point that I was trying to make if Jalen Brunson's on the floor you're never going to be out of a game and that is man what a luxury to have <laughs> like how many how many teams have that luxury really like there are great players in the league but we're also witnessing a league where, like, the Suns have gotten their asses kicked so many times down the stretch of the season. And the Clippers, even before Ka- Kawhi went down with an injury, have gotten their asses kicked so many times this season. Um, before they put some things together, the Mavs got their butts kicked a lot over the court, like the first half of the season, especially. Like, there are, you know, the Bucs. We're talking about the Bucs. There's a lot of teams in this league with a lot of great players. And I don't know that anybody quite has this, like in terms of what Jalen Brunson specifically brings, combining ability with relentlessness, toughness, perseverance. There's just no quit in him. And I think everybody kind of falls in line after that. And that's, I, I, I you, you can't talk about what makes you proud of this team without, you, you cannot disentangle that from their best player, I guess is what I'm saying. So my point going to to Tibbs with some of my praise A is for the bit of me telling you to give Tom Thibodeau more credit yeah. and B is he deserves a, a large portion of the credit pie. Last year it was the blame pie that we split into slices. This year it's almost fully a, a credit pie that we're doing. Who gets it? And I thought it was fitting some of my takeaways from today that the two guys, two of the guys that stood out in the comeback and in the overtime of the conclusion of the win were Deuce McBride, who I think has come along and made a name for himself and developed into quite the rotation player and will contribute in the playoffs. So much so that we're just like never going to see Alec Burks, hopefully, ever again in an Knicks uniform. Didn't um, see him today. So, like, you credit the the organizational competence with Deuce and and how finding him in the second round and him developing into that, what he's been. And then Preston Sachua, a throw in in yeah. the Ananobi trade. And he had a big block, a big putback dunk, uh, a big rebound uh, down the stretch in overtime because Hartenstein couldn't play any more consecutive minutes. They're not a 50 win team without Preston Sachua. They may be like a 45 win team without <laughs> Preston Sachua, but he has been important these last few months. And I say the credit to those two. Because I'm going to make a football analogy. Oh, boy. The Knicks clearly have a good coach, have a lot of nice pieces and 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 like a good corner and a, and a good edge rusher and, you know, nice wide receiver and, and maybe even a running back here or there. But we've experienced a lot of years as Knicks fans without a quarterback. And yeah. I'm saying that as a mellow Stan that I think he probably was more miscast as a quarterback and was really more of like, a wide receiver and like you're like a Randy Moss level wide receiver, but still probably couldn't carry a team in the way like Bernard probably could. And like, cause you don't know how much you can do it when it's really just your scorer. What Jalen Brunson has done this year from a leadership standpoint and just from a performance standpoint, there are three people I would put in my MVP ballot above Jalen Brunson. And it's That's it. pure, purely a statistical argument at this point. And that's where he is. He's had a top four most valuable season this year. And to be the captain, the quarterback of a 50-win team, it's why 
I'm I'm just not here for I'm not saying you were doing this. I'm not here for anybody that's like not taking this two seed seriously. Now they earn this and it's largely on the shoulders of their quarterback and their leader, Jalen Brunson. Yeah, no, look. It should be taken seriously. It is a massive feather in the cap of an organization that, and this is what I was trying to get to before and I didn't quite get there in terms of how far they have come and implicit in that is in order to go a great distance, you need to be really far down in the dumps as your starting point. And like it's four years ago, like the day the pandemic officially shut down the NBA season like I, that wasn't the low point. I mean, you argue June thirtieth, two thousand nineteen, was the low point. But like, that's the one. They yeah, and then they tried to save face, right? And then they tried it out. Bobby Portis and and whoever you know, Marcus Morris and on Gosh, press day and Julius, Alfred Payton, Reggie Bullock, Wayne Ellington, <laughs> dogs with a W and the whole thing. And it was just, I mean, it was another joke. And they were. And and at the moment that they were four for eight four four for eighteen, four and eighteen, when they fired Fisdale, it was a crystallization of what like a lot of people kind of already knew, which is that oh there was there was no grand plan, you know, or there was a grand plan, but they like there was no backup plan at the very least, you know, and um, there's no culture here, there's there's nothing, there's nothing. It was a it was a carcass of a basketball franchise. And that was, that's less than four years ago. And um, it's, you can, you can bury yourself out of a hole like that. It typically, if not ex- always, takes getting lucky in with the draft, it, usually a lottery pick, right? And winning the sort of lottery that can change your franchise around. The Knicks didn't do that. You know, they didn't do that. And nor did they get the big free agent that in terms of perception before signing a la KD Kyrie Irving. Obviously, the guy they got in free agency turned out to be pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think for all those reasons, like there is there is a genuine meaning to what they did today that goes beyond just us Knicks fans being excited about a nice shiny round number and uh, the fact that, again, they are second in the Eastern Conference in terms of playoff seating for only the second time in the last 30 years. Um, in terms of what it means... Oh, actually, sorry. One, one last thing on that because you just brought it up and I wanted to note this. You know how many players have played uh, at least one minute on this roster this year? I'll say 17. Oh, come on now. You could do better than that. 20, 22, 30, no, 100. No. I, okay. John, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so I will preface this by saying I, I read it in a, the uh, athletic article on the Pistons, uh, the, the, the disaster that has been the 2023-24 Detroit Pistons. And I'm, I'm assuming that they are correct in in their reporting here the pistons set the nba record this year for the most players ever on a roster over the course of one season with 31 the knicks this year rostered 26 different players to have that much turnover and I, and of those 26 16 of those 26 were parts of the rotation at one point in time. And I know I'm not counting Charlie Brown Jr. and Jacob Toppin, who were like part of the rotation for a night, but like Taj Gibson, right? Like Taj Gibson was a part of this rotation for a period of time. Not counting Evan Fournier, even though Evan Fournier played some games with Steve. Like it's wild. It's wild what they were able to do. And, um, and here we are. Okay. So let's, Spend the last couple minutes talking about what what where they go where what 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 lies ahead. Clearly, they did not care who they're going to play. 
not part of the calculation, which again, you, you can't be the way that they are and then also be like, oh, wait, but we're, we're going to tank away a game because we don't, we, we fear this team. Or we don't think we could be like, that's not those two things. You cannot, there is no overlap in those two circles. It is not a Venn diagram. It's just two circles. So this is who they are. This is what they did. I, I wonder what the narrative will be over the next few days. And I wonder if you think that narrative will be different depending on if Miami or Philadelphia wins their playing game. Um, so there's two sides to this. There's what you're asking. What will the narrative be? And I think there's going to be a lot of respect for the Knicks. One team has Embiid. This may be their year. They're, they're actually the two seed going in. They haven't lost since Embiid comes back, has come back, even though I'd argue their most impressive win since Embiid's come back is that double overtime win against the Spurs. Like, there's really not much impressive on that schedule since they've come back, it, especially yeah. with how unserious I think Orlando and potentially Miami are. Um, what I think is, is, is twofold is I, I think that's going to be the narrative. And the other side of it is I don't think this team cares about what the narrative is because they've been hearing what the narrative is about them all season long. And to your point, they had an out. They had every excuse to be like, I mean, every time that, oh, they're missing six guys tonight. Brunson's not playing. Hartenstein isn't playing. All right, this is a game that they're probably going to lose and we're on playback and it's a two-point game in the fourth quarter. You know? That's that's just not going right. off for thirty five points. The night of the trade the, deadline. Yeah. That's the oh Charlie. That's one of the Charlie Brown Jr. Jacob Toppin nights. Yeah. And Divincenzo's taking eighteen threes, and you're just like this. They're making Luca check back into the game here, oh. like without their full complement of, of of players against the Celtics on a Saturday night. Jason Tatum has to play forty three minutes. Yeah. You know, yep. like it's why. Look, you can you can give it to Brunson, you can give it to Tibbs, you can give it to the University of Villanova. This team <laughs> does not care about what your narrative is about them. I know. They believe they're the favorites. And, and part of it, I mean, this isn't a Tibbs thing. This is like to joke around about the Villanova thing. There's some champions on this roster. There are three guys that won championships in college together. So they don't understand this Knicks PTSD. They don't understand what the hype is about like all oh, the Joel Embiid, right? They're they're bigger in Philadelphia than Embiid's ever been, you know, or at least have won more things in Philadelphia than Embiid's ever been. As far as what their perspective is, this isn't a surprise, you know. Now, I I'm not even saying that's how my thoughts are on the series. I think I made this point to we, Alex yesterday. What series? We don't know if, what if it is. Like, look, the the Miami side of it, we could we could talk about that too. But let's just say, like, the home team will be favored in that game. Let's say it is Philly. Yeah. I was saying this to Alex in the, the final pregame pod for regular season pregame pod of 2024. We haven't in the Tibbs era yet had a playoff series that's really been like knocked down, drag out seven games. We've known by like game three how the series is probably going to go. And he, I think that w- that might be where we're headed. Like a lot of good playoff series like those Knicks Heat battles, those Knicks Pacers battles from the 90s, we were at game six with no idea who was going to win the series. So that's why I wonder if if that's the difference in how a lot of people are feeling and maybe how Knicks fans are trying to process that, well, you know, Knicks in five probably isn't on the table, but Knicks winning the series absolutely is. And that's what I think you should prepare yourself for, that basketball playoff series are supposed to go the distance, especially when the two teams are evenly matched. And while I respect Joel Embiid and I respect like Tyrese Maxey and, and honestly Nick Nurse and what that team could do in a seven game series, I respect my team more. We have home court and that's not a super team. And as I, I'll just I'll just keep saying it, John, you have Joel Embiid, we have a Hulk. You have an army, we have a Hulk. His name is OG Ananobi. Okay? <laughs> I, no, <laughs> 20 I, look, and 3 with him playing, John. I know. And they and at no point in time <clears throat> has OG Ananobi ever walked on the court for the Knicks and then walked off the court at the final buzzer or whenever he took his last step off the court and the, the Knicks were outscored during his minutes. Bingo. The next time will be the first that 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 happens. Um, 
to say nothing of Jalen Brunson and Isaiah Hardenstein being plus minus gods, uh, really, for the last several months. So, yeah, no, I, I hear that. I think, look, everyone... I don't think that there's going to be any narrative from any... I, I agree with you. The narrative is going to be like the Sixers, if it is the Sixers, like, oh, the Sixers are real, the real two seed. I think that'll be closer to it. Uh, I, I do think... I think people will give this Knicks team a shot to beat Philly outside of New York. Like we're, we, we will be confident, you know, we will feel good about it because we watch this team and all the, again, you've done a great job verbalizing all of it, but even in the national media, I think people will give the Knicks a real shot. Um, I do not think anybody will feel like if the Knicks don't win the series that they will have like that, it will be a massive disappointment or disappointment at all, you know, um, for as much as like internally, I'm sure they will be disappointed. Do you think, two questions, do you think the narrative will be the winner of this series plays the Celtics in the conference finals? And do you think the winner of this series plays the Cal- the Celtics in the conference finals? I definitely think that'll be the, well, so so the three six is Bucks Pacers? Bucks Pacers and then Magic Cavs is the other one. Those are the four teams that, well, well, really, it's Bucks Pacers that could be the other two teams that play the Celtics. Yeah. Um, I don't think people are ready to quit this Bucks team. You know? Okay. Um, I don't. I just, I don't think they're ready to, to quit the Bucks. I, I would imagine that. The Bucks will be favored to beat the Pacers. Although whether Giannis is ready to go for Game One will obviously factor factor in there. Um, <clears throat> the Pacers have uh, quietly been playing very well lately. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the narrative, like, I'm, you know, me. <laughs> You know I pay attention to narratives. And the reason I pay attention to narratives is not because I care about them. It is because I care about what might happen because of them. And I... Historically, this owner has been someone who has had... uh, Who has been susceptible to people chirping in his ear about all manner of things. I don't know if he is fully distracted by whatever his current entertainment endeavors are at the moment. I I just, I I don't know. So we can't know for sure what will happen from the tippity top if they bow out sooner than we would like them to. But I, I go through all of that to say within the locker room and even within the organization, putting aside the owner. I can't imagine anything happens in this postseason that would shake the core of what they've built. Does it potentially inspire them to be like, all right, we now know when push comes to shove in the playoffs, like we need this to get us, you know, in more another a creator, whatever. I mean, how Julius factors into that whole conversation is I think going to be interesting. Um, you know, but regardless, like I think they'll be, I think they'll be okay. And I don't, I, and as long as they continue to play like they've been playing, like even again to reference this game, this wasn't, <clears throat> this wasn't the cleanest game. This wasn't the prettiest game today. Same thing with the Nets, right? Nets game was not necessarily clean or pretty, and they found a way to win. But like, if if the Knicks lost today. It would have been unfortunate. It would have been annoying. This wouldn't have been nearly as fun of a pod to do. But we would look at how they played and we'd be like, all right, well, they gave it all they had. They left it all out there. They missed one too many shots. They were a little too careless with the ball. It happens sometimes. Um, credit to the Bulls and you move on. You know, so. You know, I think whatever comes. I'm fine with it. I I I am looking forward to digging into whoever they play. I will, I will say that. I, I'm looking forward to picking apart whatever the series ends up being and uh, and just, 
yeah, and and seeing what lies ahead for this for this team because, as you've said, as I've said, as many people have said, they've earned the right to be taken seriously, and uh, I'm not going to sit here and be like they should absolutely be favorites to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, but they should be right. I mean, it should be right there, right? Like I, I wonder what the what the sports books are gonna. I don't even know you could bet on like making it to the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't think but. you can. I I'll take a look at just like conference title odds, and yeah, I, conference I would title imagine. Odds. I'm curious. I'd imagine the Knicks are like fourth or fifth right now. I would I think. I would Milwaukee, wager. The, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I would wager they're fifth. I bet for the conference. So Boston. So you put them behind Boston, Cleveland. Philly, you think? I would bet the conference title odds right now. It would be Boston, Philly, Milwaukee. Definitely those three ahead of them. There's a part of me that wonders if Miami is ahead of them. I've thought thought about that too. Look, to your point about... Just because of the recent history. The right to be taken seriously. And like I don't think they should be favored to go to the conference finals. Um, the thing that they're fourth. Boston, Milwaukee, Philly, New York. And then they're plus 1,200 right now to win the conference, according to fans. Who's fifth? Cleveland. At what? The Miami at plus 16. And the Miami's plus also plus 16. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, not only have they earned the right to be taken seriously, I, I agree with you. That's like the perfect way to put it. Um, the road to the conference finals will have to go through them. And that's yep. the significance of the two seed. So if you want to go be in the conference finals against Boston, potentially against Boston, you're going to have to beat the Knicks, Philly or Miami or whichever team. And what they've shown all season is that you're really going to have to kill them because they're not going to beat themselves. Even on these last two days when they've played poorly, there still was moments where it's like, oh, they, they, they turned it on. Like they didn't go away and they still won the game. So, yeah, I don't know. Let's end with this, regardless of who they play. And this is the, this is what I think gives me the most confidence going into the postseason. We talk about it all the time. We, we, I mean, we've done it literally for years on the show. It's kind of becoming, it's kind of become a, a running joke. Always tracking where are they in net rating? Where is their defensive rating? Where's their offensive rating? So they finish the regular season as I'm gonna, I'm looking it up right now. As the fifth best team in net rating with the ninth ranked defense and the seventh. Oh, they snuck into seventh. The seventh ranked offense. The only other teams that have all those double designations are the Celtics, the Thunder, and the Nuggets. That's it. Nobody else could find those. Now, the Celtics, Thunder, and the Nuggets are perceived as the three quote unquote legitimate title favorites. I maybe you want to throw maybe you want to throw the Clippers in there. Maybe you want to throw the Wolves in there. Maybe you want to throw the Bucks in there. But like the Knicks are are in that category as far as a baseline of uh, of more than competence, a baseline of real proficiency on both ends of the floor. And I think what gives me real hope that they could make a long run is the notion that, okay, if they get into a series and they have a bad game and they lose maybe a game that at home or something they're not supposed to, the notion that we get into a scenario where it's like, oh my God, how are they going to get out of this? I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And I don't think that's going to be the case with this team because defensively, the notion that like another team is going to figure out, quote unquote, the Knicks defense, I don't know how you could figure out their defense with the personnel that they have. And we don't need to go through it. Like everybody knows who their defensive personnel is. Um, although the Bulls really did look pretty good. <laughs> they did. But as we were talking about it during the game, I honestly just thought the Knicks were missing shots. Like I didn't necessarily it, think they were stopping the Knicks. Yeah. Well, I no, Caruso made no, like I think the offense. I'm t- I mean, sorry, the, the oh, Bulls you're saying offense. The, oh, those, yeah. 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 I the Bulls, I thought the Bulls were good. also hitting shots. Like they were hitting shots. Point, you just and tip they, your cap. And they're a uniquely, they're a uniquely um, structured team in that they're two of their 
they're arguably their two most prominent offensive players. Like they want to take mid rangers. They specialize in taking mid rangers. And they were making all of their tough mid rangers today. And then when you throw in Kobe White, but like, is this also a little bit of the fact that it's game 82 and like this team, this was their third game in four days and like they were about to have a week off and they're never going to play another consecutive games this season? I think that's, that's all baked in. So I'm, I'm not worried about their defense. Offensively, last year, They've finished the year uh, tied for third in offense, right? And in the uh, postseason last year, they were their offensive rating was 13th out of 16 teams, ahead of only the uh, Cavs, who they decimated in the first round, the Nets, who are the Nets, and then the Grizzlies, who uh, were summarily dismissed by the Lakers in f- six games. So their their playoff offense was bad. I even with no Julius Randle, and this may be, I may come back and and rue the day that I said what I'm about to say, but I'll say it anyway. I think this team is a higher offensive floor than that team, and that is because I don't think that team ever got to a place offensively where I felt supremely confident about what they did together as a team offensively where the whole lifted the sum of the parts. And now with the amount that they move on the offensive end, and it is specifically, I think, tied to Hartenstein and DiVincenzo because it's like that really it's that threesome and then Josh Hart's kind of the wild card like is Josh Hart feeling good today okay that's you know and then and then OG obviously as long as OG's making shots and doing what he's doing you know how deep do they go like what are we getting from bogey is Deuce hitting shots like what is I mean Mitch only played seven minutes today because of an injury thing like there are questions on the bench so the bench could definitely still come up and bite them in the ass but by and large I feel good about their offensive baseline and so for, for those reasons, like if they have a bad game, you sh- it doesn't mean you're going to count them out in a series, you know? Yeah. The, the First of all, the fact that they're one of the four teams that's top 10 in offense and top 10 in defense, I just want to point out the two top two seeds in East Conference are where they fall, where they find themselves. The Thunder, the Nuggets, the Celtics, oh, the Knicks. Right. Those are the four teams that have earned the right to be top two. The problem for me is I don't look at the net rating stuff, the net offense and the defense for the playoffs because you, your net rating during the regular season is how you do over a collective 29-team sample size, right? This is That was how the Knicks played against the Cavs and how the Knicks played against the Heat. But to your point, for offensive floor, I'm significantly more confident in this offense because of the way it looks, the way that... I mean, look, we're going to look at teams try to double Brunson. And I, I loved how Doris Burke was saying in the in overtime, like every single time they double Brunson, the Knicks have a counter. They yep. have figured out that yes, if you do. try to bring help that they, they, he knows because he's a smart basketball player and a great passer where to find the four on three. And they're going to get buckets out of it every time. It's, a, it's the biggest, biggest improvement in his game this year, more than the shooting. And if you're looking to do that in the playoffs, then Isaiah Hartenstein, Josh Hart, you're going to figure out a way to beat a team four on three. We got even Genzo wide open or Anobi wide open or one of them's cutting to the rim. And then if you got to play him one on one and you don't have a Caruso out there who he may cook anyway, the Knicks are pr- still in pretty good shape. So, yeah, I, I think there's I don't think they're going to finish 13th in offense in the playoffs. Famous last words. Um, I, I yeah, I think this team's better offensively than what they were a year ago. And the East, I mean, we'll see how they, they face against um, potentially a better team than either of the teams they played last year. But, you know, we'll see. Here's what I'll say. Um, last thing, and I got to run. Uh, the, there's going to be a lot of nerves this week, certainly anticipating the Heat Sixers game and who we're going to play. And then once that result is decided, there'll be more nerves one way or the other. Which will include a watch party on playback oh, with yes. John, John, Benji, and DJ. Okay, yes. just let everybody join us for playback on Wednesday. Which we're very excited about. I'm very excited to do that with them. Um, to watch that playing game. Um, I would just... Not that I would ever tell anybody how to fan, but... Never. 
Enjoy, enjoy this week. You're the two seed. You won 50 games. It doesn't happen around here. <laughs> Again, it's, it is staggering. It is staggering in the last 50 years. 50 years. This is the fifth top two seed that they have had. So that's once a decade, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, this team is, has earned our love. They've earned our appreciation. They've earned our belief. Um, and they've earned the right to uh, certainly fight another day. And uh, we'll find out who they fight against uh, in, in a few days. And that'll be exciting. In the meantime, we'll have lots of good stuff coming up for you. Uh, I think we have Fred Fred Katz pod coming soon, right? Uh, there's a lot of plans in place that have now been reshuffled. The yeah. fun part about the Knicks getting the two seed is we get to enjoy it. The not fun is that I have no idea how to plan content this yeah. week because I don't know who the Knicks are playing yet in the second round. There are some feelers out there to potential collabs that we might do. Uh, yeah, Fred wants to do a pod. Riley? You also Pat have- Riley? Yes, Pat Riley, Riley and Eric Spolster are interested as well as Daryl Morey and... Uh, Nick Nurse have said they're interested in Who collabing. We Iverson, we could probably get Iverson, right? The Rocky statue. So we're just going to do a pod from the Rocky statue. It's, it's good still or on. from the Kaseya Center. We'll do it from the torch that's across the street. No, I, I think we should do a three-way. A, a me, me, Stallone, and Pat Riley. I think that would be a great pod. I <laughs> there think you that go. Would be, I think that'd be Why a lot not? of fun. You, yeah. Levitard, uh, <laughs> pick a Philly pick Will Smith you know <laughs> just right. get all the Philly Miami people in one room uh, th- we have a lot of we're going to cover it the way Nick's film school usually covers it because yes. just like our basketball team out- outside of today when we had family obligations we don't take days off so no we don't all right uh, thank you Andrew I'm happy we did this this is exactly what I wanted to do kind of put the put the regular season to bed to some extent but also give a, a little bit of a, a look forward because and again it like what a season what a season a lot of great moments today was just another one and uh i've kind of i've kind of kind of run out of words to describe this team they earned this yes if you watched 82 games of this team you earned it too because you were along for the ride yes we earned this we earned it i like it now we get to enjoy the next couple of days until we see who gets to earn us Oh, I like that. That was a good job. Uh, don't forget to get your playoff merch also, which uh, there's a link in the description of this episode, whether you're listening or watching. And uh, we will see you for more fun and games in whatever form that will be very soon. Peace out.